Welcome to worship this morning. This is Palm Sunday, and I know that this looks a little different. It feels a little different. It sounds a little different than what we are used to doing on Palm Sunday. I'm inviting you to light a candle. You can hit pause if you need to go get one, and then sit back in your prayer chair or gather the family around the dining room table or on the couch. Find your sacred place for our time together. Now take a breath as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Did you hear? Jesus is in town. What? How did I not get that memo? I hear there's going to be a parade. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to work this morning. Where is it? All the way out by the city gate. Oh, my. Hmm. It's just so hard to get everything in these days, but I know it will be quite the event. Well, he'll probably be back here for soon. As we come to this last Sunday of our busy series, it is also the first day of Holy Week, the remembrance of that fateful culmination of Jesus's ministry. So threatened were the authorities by his teaching that the last should be first, and that allegiance of the people should lie with the Lord God of Israel, not self-proclaimed God of Caesar, that he was a marked man when he approached Jerusalem that day. He had been turning things upside down, even in his own tradition, teaching new interpretations of Hebrew law and practices. He had shifted the thinking about what was truly important, people, not profit, healing, not rule keeping, connecting, not appearances, to the status quo, he says, give it a rest. Give them a rest. Today, we ask ourselves, who is suffering? Because we've clung so tightly to the profitable bottom line. What status quo of our day needs to give it a rest? invite you to take a deep breath. And if you have a watch on, I invite you to take it off for this time of worship. If you have a phone, I invite you to turn it off or to put it away now. And if that makes you anxious, that's okay. Just notice the feeling and give it some thought. Let these simple acts, or maybe not so simple acts, be a sign of the commitment to give ourselves a break, to give ourselves some time to catch our breath, to give ourselves time to give God attention. Let us pray. God of change, we are too busy sometimes to show up for what's important. Let us make 
room for you. Your parade of abundant life is happening and we can't clear out our schedules. Let us find room for you. Help us clear out the way we live and the gods we adore that are not you. Let us be room for you. In the name of Jesus, who got on a donkey and rode into Jerusalem to proclaim justice for the outcast. In the name of Jesus, who looked upon the people waving branches and laying their cloaks before him and vowed to love them no matter what the consequences. In the name of Jesus, who invites us to join the parade and celebrate life. Let the people say, Hosanna. Let the people say, Amen. I invite you to get your palm branch out that you colored, or you can simply raise your hand and wave it as we march around the room at home. I know that this feels awkward, but it may help you to feel connected to all those who are watching from their homes too. We will be singing, we are marching in the light of God. back into your seats, I'm going to invite you to connect with the people that are around you, starting the conversation this way. What are you ready for in your life? Or maybe reflect on the question yourself. What are you ready for in your life?
I invite you back together for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark from the second chapter. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new one from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of presence which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. According to Jewish tradition, there are 613 commandments in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible. And they fall into two categories, positive commandments and negative commandments. Positive commandments concern things that we are commanded to do, and negative ones concern the things that we are not to do. Of the 613 commandments, 365 are positive commandments, a number that corresponds to the days of the solar year. And the remaining 248 are negative commandments, which according to Jewish tradition, corresponds to the number of bones and main organs in the human body. There are 206 bones in the body. Just how many of our organs could be considered main ones is open to interpretation. Needless to say, the rabbis weren't surgeons. Their point was that the purpose of the commandments was to maintain harmony between heaven and earth. The larger point being made is that the commandments were never meant to restrict human life. The opposite is true. Even the restrictions were meant to create fullness of life. And so if you are like me and have kind of a poor memory, you might take comfort in knowing that the Torah God created a cheat sheet of sorts. God narrowed all the commandments down to just 10 from which the rest of the commandments flow. So here's an interesting question. How many of the Ten Commandments can you remember? Take a moment. How many can you name? Now, if you came up short on the list, you can take comfort, sort of, from the fact that most people can't name all ten. Here they are. You shall have no other gods. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's house. And 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or uh, male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now the first three in our tradition 
are to be the basic ways that we act on our love for God. And the second seven have to do with the way that we act on our love for our neighbor. Taken together, they are about how we respond to God's love, which embraces us before we ever embrace God. What I find curious about this list is that in modern America, only eight or nine of the Ten Commandments are commonly considered true commandments. In practice, one or two are considered purely optional, mere suggestions, if you will. This is especially true of number three, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Not many Americans tend to remember this one. In the 19th century, a number of states passed a so-called blue laws in an attempt to enforce Sabbath keeping. Many of these laws were actually designed to target various groups that the majority culture didn't find acceptable, like Jews who observed the Sabbath on Saturday and not Sunday. The legislators also sought, of course, to restrict certain activities that were thought to be unbecoming of Sabbath observance. Until 1985 in Texas, for instance, it was illegal to sell housewares, such as pots and pans and washing machines, on Sunday. A handful of states still prohibit the selling or trading of automobiles on Sunday. By and large, however, while America may slow down a bit on weekends, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, few of us treated any single day of the week with reverence intended for it in the Bible. No day of the week is dedicated in its entirety to connecting with an unhurried God. On Sunday, we may pause for an hour or two at church but then it's off to the races again. Curiously, many of us appeal to Jesus' example to justify our disregard for the Sabbath keeping. Didn't Jesus say the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind made for the Sabbath? We seem to think that Jesus means we can do anything we please on the Sabbath because God made it for us. Yet that was hardly Jesus' point. The only thing about Sabbath keeping that Jesus sought to do away with was all the petty legalism that surrounded it in his day. When Sabbath keeping had more to do with the rule keeping than connecting with an unhurried God. The rules crept in through the fence, not a literal fence, but a fig figurative fence. The one that rabbis sought to build around each of God's laws. Erecting a fence around a particular law meant that you created a series of requirements that were even stricter than the law itself, so that if you broke one of the added requirements, you were not at risk of breaking the actual law itself. If this sounds strange or unnecessary to you, consider that we do it all the time with our kids. If we don't want our children to be burned by a hot stove, we tell them not to come anywhere near the stove. This way, if they venture a foot nearer than we told them, they're still safe. In Jesus's day, the rabbis had created so many requirements in an effort to keep people away from the hot stove of Sabbath breaking, that Sabbath breaking had become a cold, or Sabbath keeping had become a cold routine rather than a spiritual practice. The original intent behind Sabbath was simple. It was a time for being, not doing. You disconnected from your daily busyness in order to reconnect with God your family, your neighbor, 
and the earth. This disconnection and reconnection ensured that each week we would all have a chance to glimpse the forest from the trees, to step out of the fray, to pull back a bit, a bit to sense life's seasonality. It also ensured that none of us would succumb to the notion that the world revolves around us and what we do. Instead, we would be anchored in the reality that the world can and does operate just fine without our constant meddling. Taking this Sabbath sensibility into the rest of the week, we would be free from becoming slaves to our own self-importance. So for 24 hours, you did just two things. You prayed and you played. That's the basic principle. On the Sabbath, you are to rest, to reflect, to give thanks to God, and to have fun. Isn't it strange that we have had such a hard time with this commandment? Who would guess today that God put such a high value on having fun? Given all the uptight and overworked Christians in the world, you'd think that God was a severe taskmaster whose greatest joy was to see us suffer under a heavy yoke of arbitrarily imposed rules. Each of the Ten Commandments actually was meant to connect us with a God who derives great joy from connection. Have you ever noticed that there is no differentiation or weighting given to the Ten Commandments. There is no order of priority or no relative importance given to one versus another. They all seem to be created equally serious. This means that the Sabbath keeping is as important as refraining from adultery or murder. What this should tell us is that each commandment protects us equally from misery. Each prevents us from tearing ourselves apart through trying to serve competing loves. If you think that the failure to keep the Sabbath could not possibly do equivalent damage as murder, you might want to consider who is excessively busy person is killing starting with themselves. And you may want to consider the damage being done right now to the world's most vulnerable people through our excessive need to produce and consume. To put it bluntly, you can break the Sabbath all that you want and you will not find a God coming after you with a hammer or a lightning rod. But after a while, you find yourself on a collision course with your own seductions. Where the Sabbath commandment is concerned, your heart begins to believe that you are defined by what you do and produce and consume. And before long, the weight of the world feels like it's on your shoulders. And you begin to get lost in the trees and lose a sense of the beauty and majesty of the forest. To put it even more bluntly, each week that you fail to set aside a day for playing and praying, you essentially send out a signal that you consider yourself and what you do more important than God and what God is doing. And since the commandment is ultimately about accepting God's love and blessing, not merely rule following, you are also signaling that you don't really care to receive the blessings that God intends for you. Is this the message that you want to send? If not, then I have a simple suggestion. For the next three months, commit yourself to the following. Choose one day a week that will be devoted to praying and playing, to rest and reflection, to worship and to recreation. And if Sunday isn't that day, 
it isn't for pastors, then take Saturday or Monday or whatever day you aren't required to work. And right now, so many of us aren't, are at home, and so working really isn't even an option. But whatever day it is, call that day your Sabbath and make it consistent each week. Be rigid about protecting your Sabbath day. But don't be so rigid about Sabbath keeping that you get caught up in the rules over the spirit behind the rules. If you mess up now and then, cut yourself some slack, trusting that God's grace is sufficient. And don't be so enamored by God's grace that you begin to justify any sort of busyness as part of your Sabbath keeping. Remember, the Sabbath is meant to be sacred time. It isn't simply for cleaning the house and getting caught up on errands. If you follow this plan religiously for three months, I guarantee that you will never break the Sabbath again if you can help it. Why? Because you will get a serious taste of the freedom that God wants for you. Just like an escaped slave, once you taste that freedom, you will never willingly wear the chains of servitude again. Amen. As we send ourselves to a time out in the prayer chair for the last time this season, my prayer for you is that if you had a prayer chair at home, that every time you look at that chair, you will be drawn to it again if only for the time it takes to take a deep breath. And if you have not been able to keep up that practice, it's okay. Don't feel guilty every time you see the chair. Feel the permission it is giving you to slow down, to remember that you are enough and that it waits for you whenever you are ready to give God some time. God is always compassion, not pressure. And that is why accepting the invitation to step out of the busyness and dwell with God is always available to you, no matter what. As we ponder Jesus' last days, we know that especially when he was most troubled and frightened, he went to the garden and he went to God in prayer. This will be a time for letting go of the things that we do not need that are weighing us down, sometimes known as confession, assurance, and petition. These three ways of reconnecting with God are ancient and just make so much sense. In confession, we let go of regret about the past, unburdening our hearts, and then we remember the promise and assurance that God will never abandon us, no matter what, even when sometimes we are the ones who have been distant. And in petitions, we let go of worry about the things that we cannot control and worry about the future, giving it all to the loving God who holds us close rocks us gently. My hope is that you will also designate a prayer chair at home and find time each day to give yourself a time out in your prayer chair, to let go, to remember God's presence, and ask God to hold all those you hold dear. 
So let's just start with some silence. And it's okay not to try to find words to fill that silence in your head. And it's okay if things won't quiet down, just find a stillness. Perhaps calling your attention to your feet on the floor or your hands in your lap and your breath in and out. There is nothing expected of you now. There is nowhere to go, nowhere to be. This stillness, this being is enough. not being aware of how our actions affect others, forgive us for the times when we just don't care. Forgive us. Help us be mindful of your call to change the things that we can improve life for all. Help us to move toward a world where your love reigns. In this Holy Week, move us to greater compassion for those who grieve, for those who are suffering. In this moment, we hear your promise, Sabbath rest was made for you. You don't have to earn it, it's yours forever. You do not ask us to be tireless, but to give it a rest so that we can renew ourselves for the work of renewing others. 
We are your children, and we know the lengths that you go to love us completely. Thank you. Thank you. We bring our petitions to you this day, O oh God. Here are the people and the things that we are worried about, and yet know that we cannot control. These were the prayer concerns that were shared with us for our God box this week. Please pray for my cousin, Sue, who was admitted to McLaren in Port Huron with low electrolytes. Please pray for our leaders as they strive to make the best decisions for all of us. For administrators and teachers and staff, bus drivers and students, as they work to figure out what the end of this school year will look like. We offer up prayers of thanksgiving for Beth as she celebrated a milestone birthday this week. We pray for a granddaughter named Krista, who is a nurse in ICU in Detroit. We pray, pray for Sherry and Renee, for Steve, who is sick with the virus, for his wife, Lisa, and their children, who are all quarantined. For my sister, Eileen, one of her patients tested positive for coronavirus. She is a home health care worker. We offer up prayers of thanksgiving for healing from Tom's surgery. We lift up prayers of faith, strength, wisdom, and guidance for parents as they address their children's fears and concerns and feelings, anxiety, and sadness. Please pray for my sister, Tracy, who is a nurse. And for Mary, who has health concerns and works at Myers and a dance instructor. Please pray for everyone learning new things, especially technology, and not getting discouraged. We lift up to you, Jim, as his treatments continue. And we pray for people dealing with isolation, loneliness, and fear. Lord, we lift up to you all of these concerns and those that we are naming in our hearts we just don't have the words for. Lord, we trust that you know what is in our hearts, our deepest fears and concerns, our deepest joys. We lift them to you and we ask that you bless us, bless the people around us, bless this world. Amen. Now sing our Lord's Prayer.
this is the time when we usually receive our tithes and our offerings, I remind you that the business of the church continues, and I invite you to mail your offering to the church office. If you are not a member of our congregation and would like to make a contribution, you can find our address on our website, St. Paul Lutheran Church. Some offerings have already been received, and so we offer a prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is What Wondrous Love Is This? Number 666. This week, slow it down even more if you can. For it is the week that we remember what happens when love demands attention. There is no better moment than now to take stock of what's important and vow to uphold it. And may you be reacquainted each day with an unhurried God who is calling you to dive deeply into love.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.